It is, it is really a pleasure to be here today, and I've really enjoyed the other talks. Um, and I'm glad to go towards the end of the afternoon because I get to build on what a, a lot of other speakers have discussed today. Um, you've heard a lot about recreation, but we haven't delved into it in depth, and so that's what I'll do today. I work for Headwaters Economics, um, and as you just heard, it's an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit research group. We're based in Bozeman, Montana. We also have an office in Helena. And we work to improve community development and land management decisions. We help communities tackle some of the toughest socioeconomic challenges of our day, things like energy development, public lands management, climate-related natural disasters, wildfire, rural economic development, and equity. Um, we're a team of economists, geographers, and statisticians, and data wranglers. And we have lots of free resources and tools on our website, so I hope you'll check out some of our resources um, after today. What I want to do is just provide a little context around recreation. It's an important part of our economy, and um, I want to describe that in a little more detail. And then I'll describe some best practices when considering recreation in municipal watersheds. And then I want to share a couple of case studies with you. One is Haskell Basin, which you already heard a lot about today from Alan. And the other is Sourdough Canyon, which is in Bozeman, Montana. So starting with some context. Recreation is big business in the United States. A couple of recent studies have just been completed, and in fact, the Bureau of Economic Analysis just put out some new data sets around how big recreation is in our economy. They also just put out some state-level data, so you can go check out detailed information for your individual states. It amounts to about 2.2% of the U.S. economy, and that might sound small, but that's actually bigger than mining. It's bigger than utilities. It's about $412 billion contributed to our gross domestic product. That's bigger than real estate, and it's bigger than all of education, K through 12 and higher education. And it employs four and a half million people. That um, is bigger or almost the same size as hospitals in the United States. So recreation is, is big business, and it's important to a lot of local economies. We recently looked at recreation counties across the United States, and there's an interactive version of this map on our website, so you can go find your own county and learn more about recreation in your county. But the USDA Economic Research Service has a typology where they identify counties that are recreation dependent based on personal income and um, gross domestic product in those counties, as well as the amount of um, homes that are seasonally owned in the county. So about 14% of U.S. counties are considered to be recreation dependent. And we looked at their local economies and found that recreation counties attract more people. This is true across uh, metropolitan areas, which are large cities, micropolitan areas, which are counties that have medium-sized cities, and rural areas. So the blue bars are recreation counties and the gray bars are non-recreation. Counties that are recreation have faster growth, and in fact, in micropolitan and rural places, counties that aren't recreation are actually declining on average. So recreation and the natural amenities provided by outdoor recreation actually explains a lot of the growth that we're seeing in micropolitan and rural places in the United States. We also found that the people moving into these counties have wealth. They have higher income than people moving into non-recreation counties. So people coming to these places are bringing with them investment income and income from past job experiences and in injecting it right into those communities. Now, this isn't without challenges. A lot of the people bringing this wealth into recreation communities um, are causing growth booms. And in these counties, we often see challenges with affordability the cost of living might be rising. The cost of keeping up with infrastructure for all that growth is challenging. And that's true for any kind of economic boom that you have, but it's, it's definitely true um, in recreation counties. Something that's important to point out, though, about the recreation economy is that it's not just tourism. We often think about recreation as being about low-wage seasonal jobs that are based on visitation to a place. And what we've found in our studies across the country, and especially in the West, is that tourism often acts as a seed to get an economy jump-started towards more diversification. 
People want to come to these places because of the beautiful natural amenities and the recreational opportunities. And so you start to attract tourists, which pretty quickly leads to improvements in infrastructure like air travel. Once you have those infrastructure improvements, manufacturing and retail become easier and more likely. Sometimes it's tied to outdoor recreation. Sometimes it might be broader than that. This is a photograph of a bicycle manufacturer in Bozeman, Montana. But Entrepreneurs and businesses and talent are also attracted to these places. And so you start to get more and more types of businesses in your, in your community. And then you also get retirees who are bringing with them wealth and who want to live in their retirement in these places that are also fun to play in. Retirees also bring the need for health care and other professional services. And pretty soon, tourism has led to a more diversified economy uh, with lots of sectors being engaged because of the outdoor amenities and the natural um, landscape around the community. We've also looked at the benefits of trails to communities, and we have a, a library you can search on our website for free that's got about 140 curated studies about the economic benefits of trails to communities. And these studies find that trails improve property values Homes near trails increase by 10 to 15 percent compared to homes that are separated from trails. Businesses attract new clients. Public health is improved the closer you live to trails. And quality of life, of course, is higher when you have access to outdoor recreation. So there are lots of reasons why communities might want to invest in recreation because of the quality of life values, the public health improvements, and the economic development strategy that recre recreation can represent. But of course, recreation is not without challenges. You can see from overcrowding that um, you end up with damage to natural resources that attracted people to the place in the first place. It's expensive to maintain all the infrastructure that's necessary when you have a lot of people recreating in an area. So communities that are contemplating using recreation as an economic development strategy have to weigh the costs and benefits and think about the trade-offs that come with investing in recreation. And this is especially true for communities contemplating recreation in their municipal watersheds. Um, so that takes me to the, to the second part today um, in thinking about best practices for recreation in municipal watersheds. We were approached by the community of Sandpoint, Idaho a few years ago because they have a municipal watershed in the Little Sand Creek. Is anybody from Sandpoint here? Oh, okay. right, right, we talked earlier, great. So Sandpoint um, gets most of their drinking water from the Little Sand Creek, and it has been closed to recreation for a long time. But Sandpoint was interested as a community with lots of stakeholders engaged in potentially expanding their recreation opportunities and connecting a trail through their municipal watershed. The trail would link the city of Sandpoint to their ski hill, Schweitzer Mountain. But they were rightfully concerned about issues related to contamination and sedimentation in their watershed. And so they asked us to help them think about best practices for managing recreation in municipal watersheds and to look at some case studies, profile some other communities and what they're doing. So um, they were primarily concerned about sedimentation and erosion and contamination from human and, and animal waste from pets. They were not considering um, motorized recreation, so I'm not gonna get into motorized recreation at all. I'm gonna just focus on non-motorized recreation. So we produced a report for them that outlines some best practices and profiles what communities are doing. And I'll describe more about that in a minute. This is on our, on our website as well, and you can read a lot more in the report itself. So some best practices that we found from communities across the West that are using their municipal watersheds for recreation. And, and I'll point out here that um, a lot of communities don't own, their don't own their watershed lands. A lot of communities get their water from national forest lands or from other sources. They're, it's actually pretty rare for cities or counties to own the land. Um, but it does happen, and there are, there are plenty of communities across the West that do. So the first thing is to engage the public, to really listen to the values that people have about their watershed and to understand and engage them in the design of the project. The second is to design sustainable facilities. And there's tons of, of best practices out there today about how to build trails so that you're using techniques like 
grade reversals and outsloping your trail tread so the trail doesn't become a conduit for water. So I won't get into a lot of detail of the technical, um, the technicalities of how to build sustainable trails, but there are tons of resources available. And another key piece of this is using contractors that are using sustainable construction techniques and that you trust. Uh, another component to this is when and where to allow people to access water. People want to get to the water, dogs and pack animals want to get to the water, but it, you have to be careful and deliberate about where you design that kind of access and um, avoid it in places where it's going to be too damaging to the water resource. Lots of communities are doing a great job gathering baseline data and monitoring it over time so they can understand not only what's happening with water quality, which is pretty typical to monitor your water quality, but also to monitor trail use or recreational use and understand what users are doing on the landscape. Um, there's some really interesting innovative techniques out there using social media, using things like Strava, which um, is a social media um, tool you can track where trail users are going and you can actually see from heat maps um, you can buy the data from Strava to see where people are going and if they're staying on the trail or if they're using other parts of the watershed that you might not want them to use. Another key component is to have a written management plan and this probably sounds obvious but you'd be surprised how many places don't actually write down their management strategies especially when there's a multi-jurisdictional management um, of, a, of a landscape. And then finally, to educate users, and, and a lot of communities use watershed recreationists to help them with the monitoring of data, and so they're engaging citizen scientists. And that feeds back because as users become educated about the watershed, they become stewards, and they become more committed to helping protect the watershed. So we've looked at several examples across the West, and many communities simply close their watersheds to recreation. The risk of contamination or of wildfire is just too great. Um, and I think tomorrow you'll hear from Santa Fe about what they're doing in their watershed. Some communities still allow tours or guided visits to the watershed so that the community can see the landscape, but they're not allowed without that kind of escort. I want to point out, though, that closing your watershed to recreation is not a no-action alternative. This is not a passive act. Closing an area to recreation means that you still need to invest in some infrastructure, often fencing, locked gates, maybe even personnel to monitor the site. Some communities use um, security cameras and are monitoring the security camera footage to make sure that people aren't entering the watershed. So although this sounds like an easy route, it isn't, and it takes a lot of resources. Some communities allow dispersed recreation, and, and by this I mean a trail through the watershed and not concentrated um, trailheads or campgrounds in the area. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about whitefish in a second. And then some communities allow concentrated recreation where they've really got developed areas and a lot of people recreating right in, in the watershed area. Um, and I'll, I'll describe Bozeman a little bit more in a minute, and you heard today, this morning, the great story of the Salt Lake watershed from Laura. So that takes me to a couple of case studies. And um, we're really fortunate to have heard firsthand from Alan earlier today about Haskell Basin. So I won't go into details about the transactional nature of that really fantastic conservation project that protected the watershed, but um, I'll describe a little bit more about the recreation aspects. <clears throat> so as you heard today, Haskell Basin is in Whitefish, Montana. Whitefish is a town of about 7,000 people right up near Glacier National Park. And there's a lot of pressures on this watershed, as in most communities. It, it provides most of the drinking water for the city of Whitefish. As you heard today, it's timber, there's important timber resources and an important cultural connection to timber in the community of Whitefish. A lot of development pressure as a fast-growing community and a high demand for recreation. In fact, we just did a little analysis for um, partners in Whitefish recently about trail use around the community. And we surveyed locals and asked them why they live in Whitefish. And um, we asked them to rank their reasons. And winter recreation and summer recreation outranked all the other reasons people choose to live in Whitefish, including work, friends, and family. So in Whitefish, there are definitely no friends on a powder day. Um, and if, as you heard also earlier today, it is important wildlife habitat, grizzly bear and, and lynx habitat in the area. 
So as Alan explained, there's this fantastic project to conserve privately owned timberlands, as shown here in red, in this sort of pink color, um, through a conservation easement, and then uh, uh, protect the city's water intake on that land. The other piece of that is that the conservation easement allowed for recreation through the land. And all these partners came together to make all of that happen. And, and Alan did a great job weaving that story today. One thing I want to highlight about what Alan mentioned earlier is that the people of Whitefish actually voted to tax themselves and to tax visitors more so that they could fund this conservation project. That's how important it was to the community of Whitefish. And I, we've talked a lot earlier um, in the day about how hard it can be to find funding. But I think this story really exemplifies the fact that uh, people care about these resources. And in many cases, they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. So one of the really interesting things about the Whitefish project is that the collaborative management for recreation was truly collaborative. This was an opportunity to invest in recreation infrastructure on that new Haskell Basin property in new ways. While Stoltz had allowed, the, the lumber company had allowed people to recreate on their property through a handshake agreement for generations, which was incredibly generous of them, once the conservation easement was established and all the partners were together, it was an opportunity to identify where that trail should and should not go in order to best protect the city's water resources. So the public works director, the trail builders and designers, um, all the agencies together looked at where and how to build that infrastructure to mitigate any potential risks to the city's watershed and to the other values, including the timber resources and the wildlife habitat. The liaison team that Alan described meets about once a year. They have public meetings so that they can head off any challenges or issues coming up with recreation in the community. Um, and in addition to any other resource management questions that are coming up. And they have a written management plan that outlines who is responsible for which components of the management. So some lessons in, from Whitefish and Haskell Basin, specifically thinking about recreation in municipal watersheds. One is that formal access increased security. The public works director told me that he's actually more comfortable today with, while, with recreation in this watershed because of the collaborative process that they've been through and because of the way the trails were designed and sustainably constructed than he was before the conservation easement and before public access was formalized. All the right people were at the table to design the project um, and it was designed with all values in mind. And then Whitefish saw this as an investment in recreation and an investment in economic development for their community. And that's really exemplified by the feedback loop that they have by having tourists and visitors help fund it. The mayor, John Mulfeld, said, by investing in these types of projects, it's how we can offer such a high quality of life and why people are moving to Whitefish, setting up small businesses and employing people. This is a strategy for Whitefish to um, continue to grow and be a strong community where people want to live and recreate. So that takes me to the second example, which is Sourdough Canyon in Bozeman, Montana. And this example is a little different because this project already had outdoor recreation and it wasn't being really managed uh, at all. And um, so I'll describe that project um, in more detail. But this one is also personal for me. That's me on the left. Um, I'm told that that haircut was cool at the time. Um, with my big sister and, uh, and then me with my family in more recent years. This is my municipal watershed. This is where I get drinking water. It's the water I feed to my daughters every day. It's also a place that I've been enjoying and recreating in my entire life. And I, um, before I joined Headwaters Economics, I spent about a decade as associate director at the Gallatin Valley Land Trust, where we helped spearhead this project. And so um, I, the, the project I'm going to show you is one that I helped lead for many years when I was at the Land Trust before I joined Headwaters. So Bozeman is a town of about 40,000 people in um, southwestern Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. And we get about half of our drinking water from Sourdough Canyon. We get a, the other half from a parallel drainage called Highlight. And I won't go into detail about Highlight. You can read more about it in our report. 
Um, but Highlight is another interesting example because the recreation there is extremely concentrated. It gets about 100,000 user visits a summer and almost as many in the winter. It has some of the best ice climbing um, in the state. So a lot of concentrated recreation in Highlight. But sourdough um, provides a lot of our drinking water and it's also um, got a lot of wildfire risk and that's a pretty significant concern for the forest managers in the region. There's a, a lot of neighborhoods nestled pretty close right up against these forests and so there's a lot of wild and urban interface challenges and concerns there. It's important wildlife habitat between Sourdough Canyon and Yellowstone National Park is wilderness. And this is a, an important wildlife corridor for grizzly bears and other large carnivores. And the demand for recreation is extremely high. Like many communities in the Rockies, everybody likes to play outdoors and Bozeman is growing. There's a lot of development pressure. It's the fastest growing city in Montana, one of the fastest growing cities in the Western United States. And in fact, development pressure is what really led us to this project in the first place. So this is a map of um, the, the watershed, or the area around the watershed. Bozeman's about three miles just north off of this map. The parcels shown in gray are owned by the city of Bozeman because that's where their watershed lands are. Their intake and a lot of their infrastructure and equipment are on that, uh, this little area here. The green is Gallatin National Forest, the blue is State of Montana, and these hash marks are conservation easements protected through private land trusts. The parcel in orange is the trailhead, and there, there's an access road that comes down here and a gate right there. So people park on this trailhead parcel and then go up this uh, trail, which is really an access road for the city to get to their water um, infrastructure. The trailhead parcel shown in orange was privately owned until 2007. And in fact, the owner was a developer and he um, was interested in putting a wedding venue on his property and was getting frustrated with the traffic um, on the property, which looked like this. There was no parking lot, there was no facility for recreationists whatsoever, and there was a lot of dumping and um, debris left and uh, there were no facilities for people. So he actually worked with, uh, with us at the Land Trust and a bunch of other partners and negotiated an agreement to transfer that land to the Land Trust. And the, at the end, he ended up donating it outright. And um, the Land Trust partnered with the Forest Service, Gallatin County, and the city of Bozeman, Montana, to work over a seven-year period to design and implement improvements to the small five-acre trailhead parcel to make sure that all those values were met. We spent two years working with the public to identify what they wanted in this drainage and how to design that on this, on this um, small parcel. So we acquired the land and then we improved the access and formalized it. Where there had just been a road with basically no parking, we actually improved that and, and um, provided facilities for people. And then the partners for, uh, finally gathered together to figure out how to manage the use and develop a written management plan. So just a couple before and after pictures. This is what it looked like before the project. The road, you can see, it has no separation from the creek whatsoever, and therefore in spring runoff events, the road became the creek. In the winter, cars often went off the road and right into the creek, which is not good. So afterwards, you can see this branch pointed out for reference. The road has moved away from the creek. We installed about 80 parking spaces, which on a beautiful summer or winter day are filled up in no time. And we installed trailhead amenities um, to help the public. This is what the trailhead looked like before. You can see it's just a typical Forest Service gate and a plywood board. And afterwards, there's a, a beautiful gate. There's, a, you can't see off screen, a vault toilet and um, other amenities there for, for the public, a kiosk station. You'll also notice there's a lot of dogs. And contamination from dogs was one of the primary concerns the city of Bozeman had when we were trying to formalize recreational access in this drainage. So one of our strategies was to educate users. And these are two signs I'll just describe. There's a dog pooping, it goes down a pipe, it comes out in a bathtub, and it says wash, rinse, repeat, yuck. This is your watershed, please scoop. Um, the other one is similar with a toothbrush. So we put these signs up in the watershed. We also actually inventoried dog poop in the watershed. We had some students go flag dog poop and GPS it so we could figure out where it was happening the most. 
And what we found is that the, the vast majority was within the first half mile of the trail. So we installed dog waste stations at the beginning of the trailhead and about half mile up the trailhead, which are managed and maintained by the US Forest Service. And um, the dog waste problem is significantly less today. These signs have become so popular, they're now spread throughout the trail system on Bozeman. People really enjoy these. <laughs> so some lessons um, out of the Sourdough Canyon project. In this case, site improvements really led to behavior improvements. Once the trailhead looked cared for and respectable, people started treating it in a care, careful and respectful way. And so we don't see as much vandalism and dumping and nuisance issues at this trailhead as we did when it was really just a dead end road. We also play to the partner's strengths. The, the Forest Service is managing the recreation. It's outside the capacity of the city of Bozeman to do, even though it's really there um, within sort of their realm. <clears throat> and so the Forest Service is helping to manage the vault toilet and the dog stations and some of those other amenities that the city of Bozeman can't do. And the city of Bozeman and Gallatin County do other things like help maintain the parking lot and plow the road. And the land trust was a nimble partner that added a lot of value. The land trust was able to come in and take the land acquisition and then eventually transfer it to the Forest Service and raise all the money that was necessary to make those site improvements in the first place. So I want to leave you with just a couple of closing thoughts. First is that recreation is important for our economy, and it's also important for our quality of life. The demand for recreation is rising. We know that we're on that trajectory across the West. But our need for clean drinking water is going to grow, too. And the two can be done together. Maybe not in every place, and certainly not under every circumstance. Um, but it is possible, as some of these case studies have shown, that you can manage for recreation and at the same time municipal water supplies. Some themes that drive success are robust public engagement, partnerships, you've heard a lot about that today, written management plans, sustainable design, and integration of public education. Thanks. Couple questions. In the back. Um, so yeah, um, and and they actually saw a decrease um, in the first few years after the improvements were made. We think it's because of the the installation of the vault toilet. Um, at the trailhead. It's a really popular winter recreation site, and um, uh, there was a noticeable difference. Let me just say there was a noticeable difference in the spring when the, when the snow melt happened. Yeah, it's a good question. I think more and more trail contractors are, um, are deploying these techniques. So a couple of resources. The International Mountain Biking Association, IMBA, has a great guide for sustainable trail construction. And um, so trail contractors that build for mountain bikes are deploying that uh, those best practices quite a bit. The Forest Service also has some really great guides about sustainable trail construction, and often Forest Service partners, because they, they do a lot with trails, will know who some qualified contractors are to work with. So those are two places to start. <clears throat>